First of all, I would uh, want to welcome you, uh, Vervaki, to the Moment podcast. Um, I'd seen that, well, you've been already looking into shamanism uh, to some degree. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, so um, maybe like, um, I guess to, to like, uh, for the hour that we have to uh, kind of um, also see with regarding to like w w what do you feel like um, so far are, are some of the like I guess uh, more um, important things that you would like to to know so I can focus more on on that and answering these questions while filling in like the basics um I suppose I would like to, my interest is trying to understand um, cognitive science aspects of uh, what's going on in shamanism and how it relates to other altered states of consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, how, how it relates um, uh, t to mindfulness practices, to flow induction practices. Um, yeah. And and a dimension that I started to do, I, I, I started a while ago, but I've done a lot more work on is also a, a more proper understanding of ritual, and how ritual is at work uh, within shamanism. Um, mm -hmm. And then what that tells us about sort of core capacities of uh, human uh, sense making. Um, I, I think it's plausible that shamanism is primordial. I think it's plausible that it emerges in the Upper Paleolithic transition. I think that argument yeah. is persuasive. And so in one sense, I think it is the Ur spirituality of human beings. And it was yes. um, and, 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 and co-evolved with our evolution into the kind of uh, symbolic, spiritual, uh, religious beings that we are. And so mm -hmm. my, hope, my hope is by understanding shamanism more deeply... I will get insight yeah. into into that that level of human uh, cognition um, and, and and where it overlaps with meaning making and spirituality. That's that's my main interest. That's why I'm interested in it. Okay. Well then, um, that's good because I've ha I have a lot prepared regarding uh, exactly that, regarding mm -hmm. like also how it ties into the flow state, especially. Yes. Yes. And flow state, implicit learning, also a lot more. I would like it now a lot more. The work I've done on the imaginal and ritual is also, I think, really mm -hmm. hugely important. Different kinds of knowing. These things, I think, are all very important. Um, also, uh, 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 um, the inherently metaphorical nature of most of human cognition and how shamanism probably developed that and helped individuals cultivate that. So things like that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. So maybe I want to like start off a bit like about, uh, I guess, the um, foundation regarding like what uh, or like what what I'm defining as shamanism, because there's sure. um, generally like um, core shamanism. That's more like Michael Harner and it's more based yes. on the anthropological um, studies that uh, that have been done. And then there's the yes. traditional shamanism, and the, the traditional shamanism, I kind of mean more the, um, well, um, Asian lineage shamanism. Uh, think think like uh, Mongolia, Tibet, Nepal, uh, yeah. for instance, yes. but also like Manchu, uh, China as well. And um, a lot of these practices come from a earlier um base that uh, stems out of the, the Neolithic, similarly with like some of the mystery school um, things as well that I've looked into regarding um, ancient Greece uh, and like the Sibel and Atis rituals too. They uh, seem to be stemming from a more um, yeah, Neolithic uh, base, um, mm -hmm. coming from more hunter-gatherer um, practices. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it goes back into the uh, upper Paleolithic transition. 
Um, yeah. So, but go ahead. Yeah, and and a lot of these um, practices, especially in the more like I guess um, Greek tradition, uh, goes back to a lot of the older um, hunter-gatherer cave rituals that they would be uh, mm. doing as well. And um, elements of that have been also uh, been uh, visible in Gobekli Tepe as well, regarding mm. this kind of uh, practices. And these practices uh, have continued yep. um, since, and from Anatolia also spread through uh, two places, such as Greece and... Yeah. Um, there's the le there's the legendary literature of the divine men in Greece, yeah, um, and deeply influenced by Thrace, uh, which seems to have preserved shamanism more. And of course, you even see it showing up. I think at least it's a reasonable proposal that Pythagoras is influenced. He goes into a cave, does a ceremony, where he is die dies and is reborn, and it's the thunderstone ceremony. We don't know what that means. Uh, but it sounds, you know, it's it's a cave, you know, it's a cave ceremony. It involves a death and rebirth. He um, he seems to get a capacity for soul flight, which seems very shamanic. Um, yeah. So I I think it's I think the connections uh, to Greece, um, and especially uh, the the transition in, into the advent of the actual revolution in Greece. I I, I find those arguments also persuasive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I've been digging um, deeper into um, different of the the concepts uh, regarding like um, and different like well, it is kind of a concept more uh, within like um, the Eastern tradition, uh, which connects to um, this concept called um, lungta or wind horse, which very mm -hmm. much ties into the um, it it's you could see it as the chi or the life force that like flows mm -hmm. up and um generally speaking you have um rituals uh connected to that also when there is a lack of this uh wind horse or lack of um this um life force uh, within an mm -hmm. individual and there's like rituals mm -hmm. that they do um, one of them uh, that the Pao in Tibet uh, do is called uh, wait let, let me it's a difficult name to pronounce La Kuk uh, yeah so La Kuk uh, Che Kuk it is called and it is uh, roughly translated as soul calling and mm -hmm. um, this ritual and more modern core shamanic um, um, kind of like, well, um, the words that they use for it is basically soul retrieval, but really what it ties into is that um, the the soul, the wind horse is uh, through, for instance, trauma and different things affected. And uh, this causes uh, depression and loss of uh, meaning is is one of the, yeah. the big things as well and a general um, purposelessness basically and um, the the rituals and the the ceremonies they do is um, is done to um, bring that back to to the person right uh, it was uh, for me it was unusual I came across the notion of a wind horse when I was reading a Shambhala by Trungpa uh, with you know a Tibetan Buddhist uh, yeah. teaching, but that's where I, I, I first encountered it. But then I've been involved with um, Charles Stang and a whole bunch of other people. The, the the sort of both the ethnographic and the cognitive scientific research into mm -hmm. this tradition of subtle bodies that also uh, are very widely dispersed. So where there is something like. Um, uh, the the experience of a body other than one's sort of gross somatic body that is nevertheless uh, important um, to one's vitality and to the cultivation of virtue and wisdom. And the interesting thing about this is it also seems to have spread. Out. So it's, it's spread and it's taken up into contexts, uh, many different contexts. In fact, it's, it's plausible that it's discovered, 
it's discovered or invented, we can talk about the ontology later, mm -hmm. um, in, in many different places, almost independently around the world. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also plausible to see it, and I don't mean this as any kind of insult to the current practitioners, I see it as um, like, like a survival from uh, shamanic pra practices. I also think that yeah. um, Leo and Ferraro and I argued that shamanism, you can also see, <clears throat> if you, you can <clears throat> see mindfulness practices and then self-suggestion, hypnosis practices. Yeah. But as you move back, as you do the cognitive science, they actually, they actually were, are probably originally practiced in an integrated fashion. And we propose that that's probably also the origin of that. The ancestor to those two different descendant streams is probably something like shamanism. So, I mean, I think, yeah. I, th I think the, the evidence of it, both the, you know, of its pervasive influence, um, in ways that are often not under not known like when i was reading the trungpa i didn't know this had anything to do with shamanism i, I thought this was just something unique to tibetan buddhism but then the way like you said the wind horse turns out to be a shamanic theme in asian shamanism yeah and he had he had just taken this into uh his version of of, of buddhist practice um yeah that's 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 right it comes from the older bon uh, tradition in uh, yeah, tibet very much. And um, I've I've been digging uh, deeper into it, into the um, into wind horse, um, and looking into the um, uh, the root of um, of it all. And it seems to be that there's um, with regarding to wind horse um, some Indo uh, so proto Indo European like influence yep. um, going on there as well, regarding like the depiction of it with um, being a um, a horse. Uh, with wings or a horse uh, that can uh, that can fly, carrying the prayer um, scrolls, yeah. yes. and um, from from some of the anthropological um, sources that I've uh, been digging in uh, into, uh, it seemed to be very much linked to the the idea of the chariot in proto in the yeah. European myth, yeah. but also the idea of Pegasus, and there's a lot of symbolism with that uh, too with Pegasus. In the Greek that, tradition, that gets taken into Neoplatonism with the idea of the akama, the vehicle yeah. uh, that allows one to move between the different levels of reality. Y um, yeah. So, wind horse so, too. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, very much. Um, and we've already talked about uh, how it, it shows up in Pythagoras and Pythagorean soul flight, yeah, uh, and ideas of uh, various ideas of reincarnation. Um, and then the, I think the tie-in with music and math is also a tie-in to ritual practices, because uh, math was uh, imaginal, because it was always geometry. It was never abstract, like algebra or calculus, like we yeah. have. It was always um, enacted geometry. Um, so I'm wondering, for me, like, yeah, um, my interest is is trying to understand um, what might be the cognitive processes at work in this. I want to make it very clear. Mm -hmm. That I understand that there are, are there are social processes at work, there right. Um, yeah. There are potentially, uh, you know, however you want to say this, religious processes at work. Um, for me, I'm very interested in how this might overlap with some uh, cognitive science, and I want to be very very careful about this because I, I fear I've been misunderstood. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about what I can talk about as a scientist. Um, yeah. And many, many people, of course, have specific adherence to belief of this shamanic tradition or this shamanic tradition, or etc. Um, I don't speak to that because um, uh, I don't have any relevant expertise. Um, I'm sort of agnostic about it because there are pluralistic traditions and they say different things. I'm trying to understand, without mm -hmm. in any way being disrespectful, um, why this phenomena is original both in the sense of i think it's at the origin of our human psycho-spiritual cognition and why it's at the origin of many different uh, mm -hmm. traditions that don't even see themselves anymore as shamanic but nevertheless uh, the the the, the, the practice a lot of the practices and the rituals are still within um 
you know, I mean, to, to you know, not, uh, not to reduce something, but of course the death and rebirth motif is of course central to Christianity. Um, yeah. And, and that, that's important in, and in, 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 you know, um, and being a healing figure and somebody who could cast out demons, being an exorcist. I'm not saying Jesus of Nazareth was a shaman. I'm not going to make that <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of silly, silly reduction. But to, but, to, but to claim that there's no continuity is also, I think, uh, a, a little, um, a little far-fetched. So I'm really interested in what yeah. this can tell us about human cognition in a way that could be relevant to us today. Um, yeah. Where do you see your interests? Because I see your interests are very profound, um, you, and, and and you're 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 practicing and researching deeply. Where do you see your interests and my interests converging or overlapping? Um. Wait. Let me put this here. Good. Um, in, in that sense, I guess um, I very much um, know a lot about like the mythological, uh, the Jungian yeah. lens, but very little yeah. about the um, psychological lens. I do know yeah. regarding like Jung, what he wrote about, um, what particular things um, link uh, to. Uh, yes. Like I've been like digging into the mystery schools, for instance, as well, and um, there's a segment from. Wait, I have it. Here uh, it's translated from ancient Greek uh, by Thomas Taylor, the Neoplatonist. Of course. And um, I've been uh, looking into that, and also like the Sibel mysteries and Gobekli Tepe, and um, also a lot regarding the um, traditions um, in Asia. And um, there's one thing that I first want to point out regarding the Asian tradition versus the core shamanic um, is that um, there's generally with the traditional more communal uh, focus. So it's more yes, um, yes, versus yes, the yes. core shamanic, which is normally more individual and more yes. client to client based. But there's also a difference in the spirits, um, what they encounter. With the Western people, it generally seems to be more compassionate and uh, tame, where the um, spirits encountered by the traditional uh, shamans. Uh, this is also um, like from studies that I've uh, read about that and um, from contact that I have with um, a shaman from England, the UK, uh, who has a lot of uh, contact with shamans from Mongolia, um, where it seems to become uh, clear that the traditional uh, spirits are more connected to nature, are more wild, more, um, I guess you mm -hmm. could call it instinctual, where the Westerns yeah. are um, are not. And uh, there seem to be also other elements um, um, missing in the core shamanic sense that are not there as much. And the core shamanic, um, they, they call these... Um, uh, spirits more ethnocentric uh, centric spirits and one of the those spirits also which is of um, interest regarding uh, this part of, uh, regarding Thomas Taylor is called the spirit spouse and it's generally the opposite gender of the person yeah yes yes and mm -hmm. um, you see that in Jungian terms the anima animus kind yeah. of idea yeah 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 right. and, and right. it's yeah. and it's something that pops up um, throughout uh, the different traditions and um, even with wind horse if you look into the um, old myths in, in the Greek um, myths uh, Pegasus comes from Medusa so a feminine aspect yeah. feminine right. um, tied to the snake snake uh, ties to instinct so that right. um, being split um, through the journey, because uh, there's a lot of shamanic elements also in what um, Perseus wears in, in the myth. He has yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, he, he basically is wearing uh, shamanic gear for protection, where you wear something like this to protect your eyes to um, that, what shamans um, wear, but also other um, ritual clothes that right, right, uh, are right. symbolic. Um, to connect to the, um, the spirit spouse. And, and with Perseus, it's, for, uh, for instance, Athena, this feminine figure that is guiding him uh, in the sure. quest to um, overcome um, overcome that. And Pegasus comes from, from that. And it links to 
um, our both our instinctual but also our irrational side, our emotional side, mm. mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. the and that ties to the anima, and um, so. Uh, um, are the spirits in um, the tradition um, more challenging, more aggressive? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. And um, are they nevertheless um, beneficial uh, within that tradition? Um, yes, they are beneficial. Not all of them, but um, quite some of them are. It depends. It's it's more black and or like it's more like nuanced in the traditional sense where in the core shamanic sense it's more um compassionate spirits there there's bad spirits there's good spirits the spirits that are somewhat in between and um a a lot of these are uh, connected to also ancestors for instance like the mongolian ongon for instance uh and and the underworld uh, a lot of spirits too and a lot of um well, there's animal spirits that come that 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 uh, come from the the uh, the lower world, the underworld, um, but also from the middle world. And a lot of the middle world um, spirits and practices that they do, um, connected to like a location, like a um, yeah, particular yeah, stone, yeah. is more yeah. like animistic and more like land, uh, kind of land spirit, water uh, spirits. There's more. It's uh, there's still an interaction going on between um, the the person and the unconscious, but it's a it's a bit um, different, and a lot of these rituals uh, fall into like what is called walking shamanism because there's two uh, one one that's do, d- uh, done during the day, um, where it's uh, where a drum isn't used, and one uh, during the night where a drum is used, and then. Uh, and why the night? Because it's more conducive to go into a trance state, and also in that there's a there's, there's a, let's say it like that you're closer to a, a more like liminal state where mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. it's easier to come into uh, contact with uh, well the spirit world, the unconscious, and to these spirits. So are these uh, are these especially non-human spirits uh, yeah. uh, much more alien? Um, and is there like is there sort of a trickster aspect uh, to uh, them? Y- uh, yes, there can that... definitely be a trickster aspect to them. Uh, right. Trickster aspect and um, some spirits, from what uh, shamans have said, also uh, they feel like they have to basically. It's like an angry wolf that they have to keep on a chain, like how they describe it. And mm. um, they're generally more. Um, yeah, wild, more in. Uh, it's more, yeah, instinctual, more um, linked to to that than uh, with the Western uh, core shamanic uh, practices. So, uh, what what do you attribute the difference to? I mean, uh, uh, it sounds like there's an inventio aspect to these spirits that they are, in some sense, uh, responsive to the kind of worldview and the way people are living. Yeah. Um, and that seems to, uh, I tend to regard these entities as transjective in nature in an important way, not just subjectively existing and not uh, just objectively existing, but existing between us uh, and the yeah. world in w- the world within and the world without in very powerful ways. And I'm wondering, do you like, this is what I, I wonder about if people in the West uh, can actually practice uh, shamanism, precisely because they don't have the worldview, they don't have a way of life. They are not embedded in nature. Uh, they are not confronting mm-hmm. the, the wildness of nature. Um, they live in a much more technologically inframed world in which the unconscious has been, to a very significantly degree, tamed by a therapeutic industry. Um, I, I, and that has... yeah. I... Go ahead, go ahead. I, I think that's basically answer kind of answering um your your question already because it's yeah. it's the disconnect from um from from nature that 
changes the nature of the spirits. That's that's kind of my theory regarding this. Yes, yes, and yes, that, yes, uh, yes. The spirits of the shamans who in these traditional societies, they're closer to nature, like way closer in connection to nature. They do sacrifices. They um, yeah. they do these rituals in a communal setting. They um, and they do do these rituals in nature and i've been trying or like i've been doing that um, as well to to try to but the thing is um, what i've noticed is that with me and the the shamans that i talk to from the more traditional there's a difference uh and yeah. I, and i yeah. think you, you kind of um can um regarding uh, like uh, in depth psychology basically also you have um that you have the unconscious, the archetypes, and then you have um, ego consciousness. And um, there's kind of like a mutual playing out. It's like the archetypes are, are the same, but the form they take are uh, partly informed by the unconscious and partly informed by consciousness, but also the, um, the, the cultural background of the individual and how these things um, come up depend on the the background of the individual and um i i really think with the traditional sense because what is really important is that the the shaman is um kind of like initiated into the mythology of the culture when um when they are um chosen and th this uh, inducting into the tradition in this min uh, mythological framework um helps them to um, be like, this is how this spirit looks like. This is how that spirit looks like. That's how they yeah, yeah. go through it. So it frames the the, um, the unconscious in, in a, a certain way so that, but also like the connection to the nature spirits and, and like nature in of itself as well in, in a certain way that this is how it looks like. So it has, so you kind of, for, um, you inform a, a frame on, on onto something, which is something that we don't have. So, uh, which is why for a lot of people who practice shamanism, I feel in, in a Western setting, it becomes more chaotic, more, um, l there's no, there's no frame, less of a frame. Yeah. It's much more autodidactic. Um, yeah. Uh, w and, w w and that has certain problematic aspects. And like you say, it's much more individualistic which also adds a problematic dimension. I'm wondering what you think of Jung's later ideas of the psychoid um, and, mm -hmm. and how this is picked up by people like Raff and others. Yeah. Um, that, that it's not only the unconscious within, there's the unconscious without. Yep. Um, and, and, and it's pattern, it's deep patterns <clears throat> within, deep patterns without. And then the spirit is that which gets them. So there's not only the resonance within oneself, there's the resonance between oneself and aspects of reality that are, um, you know, pertinent, pervasive patterns that nevertheless are probably only implicitly picked up on, implicitly understood. Um, well, and so... Yeah, Jung was moving towards that because he was trying to break out of sort of the Kantian stranglehold in his view. And, and other mm -hmm. post-Kantians like Raff, his work on ally work, I think his stuff on ally mm -hmm. working, it starts to circle back more towards um, some overlap with uh, with traditional shamanism. Although I think he still is it within too much within the individualistic framework and 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 also still too much. Um, disconnected um, from the natural world, the way you're talking about. But what do you think of that idea that it, that it, it, that it's not right? It's not the, the it's not only the unconscious within; it's the unconscious without, and how they are uh, how they are resonating with each other that we're picking up on when we come into dialogue with these spirits. What do you think of that Jungian propo and post-Jungian proposal? I would say definitely regarding like a lot of the the spirits that that are there it's it's not just cuz it's like uh you have this distinction uh within like the the shamanic tradition that is more uh, inf uh partly informed by more like modern developments where there's there's a, a distinction between what they call mind-born spirits it's basically spirits that are um within the individual and then you right, have right. The, um, the the spirits that uh, exist outside of the individual. And um, from my understanding, it's uh, more linked to uh, um, Jung's collective unconscious. 
and and yeah. these are more the the um, the the patterns that play out within nature or within like um, society the, uh, and individuals yeah. as a whole. And um, th there is both. So what yeah. Oh, go ahead. Is, I was going to ask: Is there is there some recognition of them? Uh, you know, not not being necessarily independent, but having a reciprocal relationship. Because I mean, the, even that mind born stuff is going to be internalized from uh, the implicit patterns you've picked up on in your environment. And even though I, I don't know what to call it, the world, but the world born things are also going to be subject, right, to degrees of projection, uh, yeah. to the degree to which we are, um, you know, filling in the archetypal pattern with specific imagery. Uh, etc you know the mind born stuff yeah. I, I i guarantee it's still going to use the cultural and cognitive tropes of western civilization right it's yeah. going to right um yeah so. and that's it's uh, something that the shamans also remarked and i uh, found myself is indeed very difficult and it's to distinguish between the mind born and kind of like yeah the world born spirits and um right. Uh, from what they've pointed out, it generally takes uh, a very long time of practice, like uh, I think like decades of practice to be able to really distinguish between the two of what is what, what is actually just part of your own unconscious and what is actually part of the the, the world. Um... I see, I see. So a part of the shamanic training is to pick up that capacity for discernment. Yeah. And and to deploy it virtuously, I expect that you, do, yes. you don't just you, yeah right. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know. Well, that I I think that it, that's very int for me. That's uh, it's very useful to know because it's convergent with a lot of the uh, ideas I have about the nature of cognition. Um, that's very helpful. So, and I know you. I don't. I don't want to mm -hmm. prejudice you against your audience. So I'm not trying to draw you in or bait you or anything. What do you think is the like? like yeah. How should we properly relate these two kinds of shamanism together? Should we try? I mean, there's temptations. There's one to say when you could be a complete relativist and say, well, the, our shamanism is our shamanism, and their shamanism is their shamanism. And for me, that's not very helpful because then what you everything will just fragment down until my shamanism and your shamanism, right? And yeah. then it becomes completely yeah. autodidactic and isolated and individualistic. So I don't, I, I don't find that a very persuasive. Mm -hmm. The other one people t often do will say, well, the, the traditional is real and, and, and the Western is sort of fake or a pro uh, inappropriate uh, cultural appropriation or blah, blah, blah. Or mm -hmm. there's a third option which says, well, could we see how they overlap and how we can use each to understand the other so we could get to at least some ideas about shared underlying processes and this is a, this is the approach i'm most interested in yeah uh, which one which one of those three do you think we should pursue i, I would say cuz I, I would say there's nothing really wrong with the um, the core shamanism and the pra and the practices yeah. that they do but i do think that there's much to learn from the uh, from the traditional sense of of what they're doing and um and 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 kind of um be more informed about uh, about that because there there is a lot more that, that can be also analyzed from a union and but also psychological lens that we can understand um even though some shamans uh, especially like a lot of elders don't uh, like um the the psychological lens even though some younger uh ones uh, are more fine with it, it, it yeah, depends yeah. On, on their like um, background because th th there's a bit of um, especially in the Eastern like uh, lineages, a bit of like a um, discuss regarding like mm, don't don't like don't psychologize the sh uh, the spirits too much. So it, it is a sensitive um, subject gen generally uh, with with some of the lineages that. Uh, so are they worried about a kind of reductionism that's all that's going on there is i mean uh generally you know. yes that they, it's re uh, reduced to basically ah this is just instinct ah that's just this and basically reduce it to um to like something where, well where kind of like they're afraid to that it loses its um uh 
or like yeah it becomes too intellectualized basically that's kind of their fear because they uh they they see these spirits as um real in some sense i get that real um not just that but they're um they're their own kind of like um forces in uh, in some sense even the mindborn ones are are basically uh sim- similarly um so some of them for instance uh that i've been like looking into myself um regarding actually myself is uh yeah. what i started to figure out was that some of the spirits that i actually encountered are not uh what we would cl- uh, really classify as spirits but as complexes so psychological complexes sure. yeah yeah there's so, that and there's all kinds of other things that are going on and th- there's a there's a lot going on i talk about this in my new series after socrates the self is inherently dialogical in nature both internally and externally yeah. Um, and, and 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 that's very much what uh, Socrates was on about. Uh, so I'm one. Uh, when you yeah. talk to the traditionalists, and I gather that you talk to them very respectfully, or they wouldn't talk to you. How do they deal with sort of the, the pluralism issue? Uh, you know, the, the, these shamans here have these spirits. These shamans here have those spirits. There's variation. This is there's historical, geographical variation. Obviously, right? There isn't a simple singular uh thing going on there how do they deal with that because uh, uh, mm-hmm. part of what young tried to part of part of what motivated young um and i don't completely agree with his way of doing this but part of what motivated yeah. young was an attempt to find to get beneath the pluralism <clears throat> say well there's all these differences but there's an archetypal thing that they all share and then they have the cultural variations they're rejecting that and i understand why they might do that how do they deal with that Pluralistic observation. You know, I mean, I think you can make a plausible case for an also in, independent in, indigenous shamanic tradition in Mesoamerica, right? Yeah. Um, I, you know, and, and, and perhaps we could even make a, a claim for, you know, uh, indigenous uh, shamanism within Australia. That would be a little bit more challenging. Yeah. But there's something that I think it's many, many people, uh, uh, you know, are, are very. Um, comfortable calling shamanism that exists in, in Mesoamerica and it's indigenous, it, it pre-exists w- the contact with Western civilization, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. What do they, and, and I, I take, like I said, I, I take it that you're talking to them with respect. How do they respond to that issue or do they just merely ignore it? Um, regarding just uh, what, regarding the fact that, that there's, there, let's say there's shamans in, in, in Mesoamerica Right, who yeah. have totally different spirits and a totally different, you know, mythological past, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Uh, like, what do they say to that, mm-hmm. or do they or do they not address it at all, or or what? Um, it depends on the on the on the tradition, but generally, what they um, consider shamanism, at least the the, the Asian traditional uh, shamans. Uh, is basically the use of an instrument or uh, or something that uh, leads to a trance state, uh, yeah. with also spirit possession being there and and soul flight. That's one yes. of the big uh, kind of like criteria that they that they have regarding what is shamanism. If it doesn't have that, they generally don't see it as shamanism. Regarding spirits, um, in in the Asian tradition, there's a lot of like. Oh yeah, this spirit is like linked to like uh, it's, it's similar to this spirit that we have kind of right. uh, approach to it. But they're really about the lineage, and uh, they respect uh, each other's lineages. If you're more like a shaman that is just doing its own thing, and is not in the lineage, then generally speaking, uh, there is more um, skepticism towards that. And they're very much about like well. Um, that that it's a, a basically a, yeah a lineage. So there's like a mythological frame uh, with that. There is a, and if you have these like um, if you have the frame, the the being actually taught and guided and um, and actually like uh, go through uh, necessary steps basically, then um, they're then they're generally um, fine with that and they respect the other lineages generally speaking but um i understand that's 
I understand that. I, I think, given the definition you give me, that the Mesoamerican lineages and uh, the indigenous uh, lineages in uh, Australasia are would 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 satisfy that definition quite readily, quite well. Uh, and and I understand a mutual respect. I'm wondering what their ontology is. How do they? I mean, how do they? How do they deal? Do they think all of these spirits exist, or do? Uh, uh, do they? You and I, yeah, I think, are trying to find underlying universals. Yeah, uh, and you're you using a Jungian framework, which I think has great value, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm using that, uh, but more so also a cognitive science uh, framework to try and understand it, Be because we're trying to get at um, sort of again, not trying to. I'm not trying to be dismissive, but we're trying to get at well, but what what what's the universal thing going on here, underneath all of these differences? Uh, no. I mean, I, I I need to look for that if I'm if I'm going to be a scientist rather than just a cultural recorder, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there, especially amongst the younger shamans, are there is there any attempt for them to try and come up like do something like you're doing? Uh, to try and find well underneath it there's this way of explaining the differences that doesn't have them all sort of fragmented and isolated and incommensurable with each other i'm uh, sorry that was a long that was a yeah. long question but uh, um, did, did you, generally did you get the uh, yeah i don't know i i have i've generally seen more uh western practitioners that uh that are more interested in like a union or more a universal uh, lens generally yeah. The traditions seem to be more just focused on their um, framework, and and uh, they don't mind as much. It works, so they. It's very pragmatic. I get that. Yeah. So do you think that you think that perhaps the presence of, you know, a scientific worldview in the West, um, is what impels people to try and get uh, within core shamanism. Uh, you know, I, I can definitely see that in Harner's work, right? He's trying to get mm -hmm. underneath, right, all the very, and he's trying to, he's trying yeah. to get sort of the, 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 the you know, uh, in, a, in a broad sense, a scientific account of what's going on. Um, do you think, uh, 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 do, so does that mean that these, if, if that's the case, then that would mm -hmm. seem to imply the reverse, that these traditional uh, Asiatic lineages are, you know, uh, are going to be hard pressed as the scientific worldview becomes more and more prevalent in their world. Uh, that could very well be. Yeah. Could very well be. Gen so there's, there, yeah. It, 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 just to interrupt you, and then because I want you to give the uh, response to that point and the, this follow up point, which is, and it means that there's something maybe perhaps mm -hmm. that the traditional shamanism can learn from the core shamanism which is how to try to interact with an increasingly powerful and pervasive scientific technological worldview maybe that's something the traditional shamans could learn from core shamanism maybe there's something you said there's something the core shamanism should learn from traditional you've made a good case for that yeah i'm, I'm trying to make a case for the reverse that traditional shamanism could learn from core shamanism how to try and confront a scientific technological worldview um Probably there, uh, because core sham uh, shamanism is generally more, um, yeah, right. uh, exposed to it. I would not exactly know. Um, yeah, I wouldn't really have an answer to exactly like um, how or or what, but sure, sure. And I'm proposing something very de novo, but I'm wondering if there's a possibility mm -hmm. of you know, a genuine reciprocal dialogue between core shamanism. And traditional shamanism along those lines. What can shamanism le learn from traditional shamanism? But also, what can traditional shamanism learn from core shamanism? Uh, because I think that would be very powerful uh, for mm -hmm. um, um, for getting a better, more comprehensive understanding yeah. uh, of shamanism and how it could maybe or maybe not uh, fit into. Um, a scientific technological worldview, because you, you and I have both noted that that worldview tends to truncate shamanism, disconnect it from nature, 
a disconnected from the wild side of this of the psyche. Um, yeah. This is the, very interesting, though. Very interesting. And I, um, I should, yeah, I should it, go very soon. Uh, did, is there any any final thing you'd like to ask me? I'm happy to come back again and continue this discussion at some point. I, I, I'm enjoying that, this. That sounds uh, sounds awesome. Um, if, we, if perhaps at some time we can yeah. talk about that, like um, we've spent a lot, uh, and I've been happy to do so. Sort of your presentation, but maybe at some point we could also turn to yeah. uh, the, the cognitive science I've tried to bring to bear to understand shamanism as well. Um, yeah, there's there's more stuff regarding really like the mystery school side, and um, yeah. I want to talk about flow, and I want to talk about implicit learning, and I want to talk about perspectival yeah. knowing, and I, I want to talk about the imaginal and ritual, and how all of those things are showing up. Um, I think in shamanism, I uh, and um, so um, maybe we could we could set a date to do that. Um, yes, v very much so. Would be would very much um, be a, a good thing, I think. I, I think there's a much that I can learn from the cognitive science um, side. And there's a lot of um, symbolism that I've looked into. Um, and one, one of the, the, the big things maybe is the, um, that I still want to bring up regarding uh, the mystery schools is because uh, the Sibyl Atis mysteries uh, also use um, use drums and symbols yep. uh, to yep. Yep. induce trance state and yep. uh, to commune with the um, the goddess or uh, with this figure Atis that was the uh, attendant of um, of Sibel the goddess. Uh, women would generally do that, but um, there's something um, from a Jungian perspective also regarding the mystery schools and it's this uh, Thomas Taylor quote that I uh, mentioned uh, where it says at the start our irrational side is like the titans destroying our rational and higher self when we neglect our intuitive intellect which is hidden within us and connects us to both the lower and higher aspects of ourselves we become like the titans or traitors uh, to ourselves. But when we align with this intuitive aspect, we become like Bacchus in control and harmony with our irrational side. And um, this is like an English translation uh, by Thomas Taylor of a text by Olympio Doros. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I resonate very strongly with that. Uh, at some point, I would like, after we do the cog side, to talk about um, these deep resonances between shamanism and uh, Neoplatonism. Thomas Taylor was a Neoplatonist, for example, yeah. and Olympia Doris is as well. I, I'd like to uh, also talk about that. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. let, let uh, like I say, I should go. I have another meeting. This okay. was great. I, no, I, I really enjoyed this. I'm learning a lot from you, um, and, and I'm appreciating this discussion. And uh, I'd, I'd like to continue on um, and, and like I say, if we could do something around um, the Cogsci side. Yes. And then maybe um, another one around uh, the resonances between shamanism and Neoplatonism. I think that would be really, really, I'd find that very worthwhile if, if, you, if you would also find it worthwhile. Uh, definitely, definitely. Because I've been looking into that and the, the different links also within um, t um like the yellow shamanism that it links more to like um, the it's like uh, it's influenced by uh, Buddhism and there's also yeah. like the the three doors of liberation with that and uh, wind horse and there's a lot more <clears throat> to say regarding to that but also the three parts of the soul uh, from Plato and um, of course of course the, yeah, yeah yeah there's a lot. Okay, yeah. well, this is a good beginning, I think. I think this was a good beginning. I think uh, yes. uh, this got Likewise. a lot of stuff laid out. And, and I'm, I'm enjoying uh, talking with you because I'm learning a lot. Uh, you, you bring a lot of uh, careful thought to this, so very much appreciated. Yes, likewise. It was a, right. a pleasure. Great pleasure for me, too. Uh, like, reach out uh, to Madeline. We'll set up another time. And uh, I'd like to do at least a couple more along the lines that I've mentioned. Yes, you. Uh, this this is very good. Uh, 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 well, we'll talk later. Yes, uh, uh, I should go. I'm I'm already late okay. for my next meeting. It's been a great pleasure. Okay.